Association about traditional tobacco and is analyzing the commercial tobacco data from the California Tribal Behavioral Risk Factor Community Survey. This technical assistance webinar is hosted by the National Native Network and the Indian Health Service Clinical Support Center. We are pleased to offer continuing education units for participation in this webinar. <clears throat> I want to note that no commercial interest support was used to fund this activity. The Indian Health Service Clinical Support Center designates this live activity for one hour of AMA PRA Category 1 credit and one contact hour for nurses. To obtain a certificate, you must attend this entire webinar and complete the post-webinar survey that will be emailed to you. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to, one, differentiate between commercial tobacco and traditional tobacco, two, describe differences between American Indian and Alaska Native communities related to traditional tobacco use, and third, identify two commercial tobacco abuse interventions working for American Indian and Alaska Native communities. Questions will be answered during the last few minutes of the webinar. Please type your questions into the chat box on the lower right-hand side of the screen. At this time, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Tony Abramson and Harlan Downwind. Hello there. Um, thanks for having us. I'm with I'm Tony Abramson with the Sioux Tribe of Chippewa Indians. Along with me is Harlan Downwind, traditional practitioner for our program. Um, I'd like to do a brief overview of our program. Uh, we are the Sioux Tribe Traditional Medicine Program. <clears throat> and a little bit of a background, our program objectives, one moment. Uh, we offer a holistic medicine approach um, focusing on the mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual needs of our patients. Um, we have services to meet spiritual and cultural beliefs we encourage and teach individual well-being and health. We support health education and disease prevention goals for the strategic health plan and facilitate the integrations of traditional and Western medicine. The uh, types of services provided, traditional medicine procedure and ceremonial functions by practitioners, we provide consultation, diagnosis, and treatment to our patients. Also with provisions of treatment, um, with traditional plant and herb medicines and or specific ceremonies. Um, we also have um, provide uh, healing sweat lodges that are prescribed by our practitioners as well. We offer seasonal fasting ceremonies, releasing ceremonies, and arthritis treatments. Referral to Sioux Tribe medical providers, substance abuse, and mental health providers, as well as referrals to Medewin and Big Drum ceremonies. We also collaborate with the Cultural Division on annual summer warrior camp for youth. We help to reestablish rare plants and medicines onto tribal and private property and offer in-services for teachings throughout the winter months. We were established in 1995 and first in the U.S. to be integrated into a health delivery system. A long time ago, Adam Lucier and uh, Ted Hollipa laid the groundwork, and, and we still exist today from there. Uh, we have Harlan and Keith Smith as our healers on staff. And uh, the traditional practitioners are employed to provide on-site service throughout the seven-county service area. So we're at each uh, tribal health facility. Some of the medicines, <clears throat> the traditional practitioner assistants gather, process, and make the plants and herbs that are stocked within the traditional medicine pharmacy. Throughout the summer months, in particular, the staff works very hard to supply all clinic sites with the year-round pharmacy. Volunteers are an integral part in keeping up with the demand of traditional medicines and also assist with many sweat lodges and other ceremonies. We attend professional service organization meetings with our, within our department. So we're meeting with our medical providers and they're on the same page with some of the treatments. We're, we're uh, giving patients and, and 
able to give referrals to one another. So it's a good teamwork and progress. And uh, we also participate with our drug court team. Um, we sit on that collaborative body to help people with addictions and, and other problems. Juvenile Detention Center, we provide sweat lodges there. Behavioral Health and Cultural Division. Some of the highlights of our program are we offer uh, seasonal arthritis camp, releasing ceremonies, fasting ceremonies, warrior camp, and a women's camp. And now I'd like uh, Harlan to introduce Harlan Downland and to speak on how we use our tobacco. Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to deviate a little bit from the commercial tobacco uh, um, that is up on the screen. I'm going to step back a little bit and tell you a little bit of our legends and a little bit of our cultural uh, aspects of what we use tobacco for. Um, a lot of you know that America was based on the tobacco trade. Uh, tobacco was the uh, original plant of the United States and uh, came mainly from the East Coast Indians. Uh, we still look at the Haudenosaunee or the Mohawk people as the leaders in uh, producing a, a still uh, our great uh, cultural tobacco that we use. And uh, it's very highly uh, uh, prized here as a, a, a prayer method. Our tobacco, Naganazud <clears throat> Seima, we say Naganazud, that means uh, uh, leads. And we say our tobacco leads everything for us in a sacred manner. It leads our ceremonies, uh, it leads our events, it leads our war parties, it leads all the things that we're involved in. Nagana uh, the same. Tobacco is always first for us. <clears throat> and what we do with our tobacco is we use that in a sacred manner. Uh, we use it for uh, offerings, spiritual offerings, and spiritual. Uh, well, the offerings and what we call um, uh, giveaways, and we use that for, for that. Well, we always offer tobacco for knowledge and for uh, uh, lessons that we learn from our elders, medicines that we get from our elders, all of these things that we have um, today uh, that we keep our tobacco in a sacred manner. And uh, like Tony said, we advocate for prevention of sickness and illness and we're finding that tobacco is one of uh, tobacco abuse is uh, uh, one of the leading causes of a lot of the uh, illness that comes to our clinics. We begin um, using our tobacco at a very early age. Uh, we still have a lot of uh, difficulties with our children and we tend to offer a lot of our SEMA for them because of the way the laws are for uh, natives today and we can't really freely use our tobacco in the manner that uh, uh, our traditions uh, dictate to us. We end up uh, uh, using uh, tobacco for our children until they're old enough to uh, use it in, a, in the way that uh, uh, dominant society pre uh, predicates its use. Uh, we uh, advocate to our children to use tobacco at an early age. We have our children offering tobacco uh, right uh, as soon as they can understand that it's the prayer that we're using it for. Uh, most of our children today see uh, abuse first. They see somebody smoking a cigarette or chewing tobacco or that type. <clears throat> We're uh, in the traditional community. We're trying to change that so that our young ones see uh, traditional tobacco as a prayer, a way to pray, and a way to communicate with uh, the Great Spirit. That's the teachings on our tobacco from a very young age, and that's the teachings that we do to keep it sacred. We teach our little ones, this is how we use tobacco and this is what it's for. We don't teach them the, uh, to use cigarettes or uh, 
Um, in fact, if you've ever seen traditional tobacco, it's a little different than uh, commercial tobacco or uh, the commercial tobacco that we have. Uh, <clears throat> our uh, commercial tobacco um, is still the tobacco plant that we hold sacred, but it has all these uh, other chemicals in them that are harmful to our to our spirits, to our to our people. Um, there's uh, 4,000 chem chemicals in there: uh, cyanide, benzene, formaldehyde, methanol, acetylene, ammonia, and <clears throat> um, nicotine, uh, carbon monoxide, tar. There's all kinds of things in commercial tobacco that are not with the, uh, the original plant that we use. Um, I'm going to go back again to our traditions, and uh, as uh, we talk about traditions, uh, the plant tobacco was given to us by the Great Spirit uh, as uh, for uh, humans to use. Uh, the, our legends <clears throat> teach us that the spirits were uh, great in all things and could do many things, eh? and we as natives were weak and uh, pitiful, and so the Great Spirit grew, made the tobacco plant and gave it to us as uh, a people, and it's the only thing that the Great Spirit didn't give to the, the Monadu or the spirits. He gave that to us to use, and that's the way that we were taught to pray with that is that when we offer our tobacco uh, and we pray with it in an appropriate manner in a good way, that those spirits want that tobacco from us, so they come, they come to listen to us. They come to hear what we are asking and what we are requesting of them. And like I said, uh, we know the spirits are real powerful. That uh, in our traditions and legends that teach, eh? and they have a great wealth of power. And we as human beings, we are uh, pitiful, and eh? we are adinagazi uh, anishinabe. That means like. Uh, we, we have nothing, and uh, the spirits have everything, and that's the way it is with, the, with our creation stories and with all these things that we, we begin with, and the same with tobacco. Tobacco has a beginning with our people, and that's like we go back that far to, to talk about the sacredness of uh, what it's used for. And we talk about our uh, tobacco. It's the first plant the Creator gave to us to use, uh, and since then, it's like we say, Naganazud uh, Asema. It leads in every one of our ceremonies. There's no ceremony that can happen without our tobacco, the sacred tobacco. Um, and you know, we make our own tobacco. We use uh, red willow primarily. Uh, we have tobacco. We do have tobacco leaf in there, uh, sage, cedar sweet grass, uh, other types of uh, uh, ingredients that we add. Some people add uh, uh, bare root, all kinds of different ingredients to kind of make it up uh, as individual as you like it and to taste and to taste the smoke. And we believe that our tobacco that we use should never be inhaled into the lungs. We burn the tobacco in our pipes. Uh, we take it in our mouth and exhale it immediately. We don't uh, inhale. Uh, we don't smoke for pleasure, you might say. Um, one of the things that um, uh, in, in our use of tobacco, also uh, we place it on the ground, on the clean ground. Uh, that's another way to offer it. We offer our tobacco to uh, fire. Uh, we burn it in the fire. <clears throat> and these are some of the appropriate ways to use that. We put it in the water. Every time we take uh, go fishing, we put the tobacco down for uh, a good fishing trip, and we put uh, tobacco down for the fish that we take. We take uh, as hunters and gatherers everything that we gather. Like I said, first thing we do is we pray to those uh, plants that we take. Um, our medicine and healing plants are also our tobacco is offered. This is the sacred uses that uh, we try to teach our children now. Uh, uh, and like I said, a lot of our young people don't see uh, any of this kind of prayer use of our tobacco. They see uh, abuse, they see somebody smoking a cigarette or 
uh, even at some of the little gatherings at home, which is getting to be a lot better. Uh, there used to be a lot of cigarette smoking. And in fact, uh, one of the elders said it got to be, they call it old pogans, which means a little pipe, which they would say for cigarettes. Eh? And one of the elders said that it was just a, a real convenient way to burn tobacco was to use a cigarette. And he believed that many people got started smoking uh, for pleasure off of uh, those what they what they call little pipes because they would just burn them in a ceremony in the cigarette form. Uh, nowadays they're they're not doing that so much anymore. They're passing. They say if you have a pipe, they'll fill your pipe with uh, the regular traditional tobacco, or else you can offer it out to a fire at the ceremonies. So even in our own um, our own ceremonies, we had a little bit of abuse of, of tobacco because of the way uh, how easy it was to just use a cigarette instead of making your tobacco, mixing all the ingredients and putting all these things together uh, when you can just go buy a pack of cigarettes. But uh, the focus is changing again back to the real traditional way, uh, taking our time and giving the plants the respect that they, they need for uh, for making it into a prayer mixture. Uh, like I said, some people just use straight tobacco plant. Uh, and we have all these other herbs and uh, plants that we can mix into uh, to make a uh, sacred ingredient. But uh, we too, uh, we focus on, uh, for people that come into our program, we, we focus on tobacco cessation of abuse. Uh, we point out uh, the dangers of what tobacco is, and we promote the use of our tobacco in a sacred manner, in a prayer manner, to even help them uh, beat their addiction to uh, nicotine and commercial cigarettes. Again, I'd like to thank you all for listening to me, and uh, I'll be open for any kind of questions uh, when we're, the Q&A starts. Miigwech, that means thank you in our language, and I hope. <laughs> Hello? Could you hear me? Yep, I'm great. Okay. Huinga Janakogo Nunako Mungo Adikto Dem Anima Alita Jimia Wok K B I C Atama Alexi Jimmy Nunako Mut. So my name is Tanya Bailey, I'm from Nelson Island, Tuxtuk Bay, Tuxtuk Bay, which is Nunako Yermut, and I am Caribou Clan, and my father is Yupik Eskimo, and my mother is uh, Alita Jimmy from the Kiwana Bay tribe. Um, she is Ojibwe, and she's Lakota. And so I just wanted to quickly introduce myself and then also say chimigwich to uh, Tony and Harlan for um, what they just presented on. It's always really good to hear um, those teachings from Harlan. Um, so today, um, a couple of my goals are to share a bit about um, the strengths of the Alaskan youth uh, some of the history about Ikmi, known as Black Bull, um, some of the culture and some of the traditions of the Yupik people, and some of the thoughts about uh, messaging. So, Robin, were you able to figure out a way for the uh, for the YouTube videos to be shown? Rob, Tanya, the, not any better than what you'll 
what you'll be able to show. Okay. Well, I'll show the first one, and then since everyone's going to have the handouts, they can go on the YouTube links. Because I read, you know, it's a little slower, but I don't know if everyone has seen Eskimo dancing. Um, so these dancers are from Tuxic Bay, and it's a great combination of traditional and contemporary um, Eskimo dancing. And the other video, which uh, we're unfortunately not going to be able to share due to um, the um, slow live stream, is my cousin Byron Nikolai. He is um, his parents are Dora and David Nikolai, so he's been um, a pretty popular youth um, in Alaska. His YouTube videos of him singing has gone throughout the state and there's been some news articles about him. Um, so I I won't show the video if it's not going to if it's going to be slow. Um, in looking at in looking at um, This next slide, this is uh, called Ikmi, known as Black Bull, is one of the names. So um, to the, the long stem is the chewing tobacco. It's a big leaf. When you spread it out, it's probably about um, maybe half a yard or so in the... And the little area that is known as punk. So depending on which region that you are living in, um, like within our community, we don't have, in our, in our island area, we don't have trees which, you know, would have the punk available to you. So they would make the ashes out of the willow tree. So that is a picture of what um, could possibly be willow or ash punk. And so the use of ikmi, which translates to things to put in your mouth, began in after the mid-1700s when Alaska natives began to trade with Russians and European explorers. And this is according to a report in 2007 by the state of the health department. Um, so Yupik and Chupik natives did not use tobacco in our culture or traditions as a way to pray with like Harlan had just shared or something to, you know, to, to put your prayers in and so forth. So we did not, you know, have tobacco in our culture um, for those purposes. So this primarily is just used for, for pleasure, as he had mentioned. So um, looking at the Alaska Native youth, um, one of the great uh, things that we get to share amongst all the other uh, Native and non-Native youth is something called Native Youth Olympics. This is one of my favorite sports. Um, we all share the common love for it. There are um, also different loves of like basketball, but today we're going to just, I'm just going to speak to Native Youth Olympics. So this helps build confidence, self-esteem, healthy lifestyle, um, team, dedication, commitment. Some of the cultural teachings and uh, that are, that coincide with some of the games like the scissor broad jump is something that a technique that was used when men would be jumping from um, uh, one floating sheet of ice to another. And then so um, talks about discipline and respect for the environment. 
Um, so I was, you know, in t thinking about um, the youth and the messaging that could be um, shared throughout the state would be why not ask to partner with some of the sponsors and the teams that participate in NYO to have a campaign um, to pledge to be tobacco free. Um, so we could start looking at harm reduction, you know, so say if, you know, the youth is already chewing ICME or tobacco, you know, let's look at the different stages, um, like harm reduction. So in this slide here, you'll see um, the male doing the one foot high kick, and then this is the female to the right, getting ready to do either the two foot high kick or the one foot high kick. Um, one thing I noticed when I went home a few years ago that has evolved since I played was um, the participant is asking for encouragement from the opponents and the crowd, and they begin to share their support by clapping and cheering for the participant because the next level, you know, the third time that you miss the, the object, um, then you are disqualified um, or you're eliminated. So I was thinking of like uh, using something like this that's already embedded within our youth and our communities is have a slogan like, um, you know, let's cheer for one another to, to not use tobacco or to get off tobacco. And this would be like a really perfect um, poster, you know, in the middle, in the center of um, the seal skin ball, you can say that's the goal is to be ICME free or tobacco free and let's all cheer for one another, you know, so that we are all healthy. So this is um, a picture of my grandma Teresa and this is Peter John. So a couple of years ago they uh, were a part of a research where the uh, elders were flown into the Smithsonian Museum to identify different artifacts. And so the pictures here are of pictures of little boxes. One is like a a copper, not a copper thing, um, wooden um, containers that were used to put your ICME in and that's how much they really treasured that because um, it wasn't, you weren't able to get tobacco all the time so what they did have they really treasured and um, they hadn't seen um, these kind of containers since they were little kids. So within our Yupik culture, our name is a very significant aspect of our culture and traditions. This is what connects us to our ancestors, to our present, and to our future. This is a part of our legacy. So my Yupik name is Janach, and I'm named after my, my grandpa, and that's who I represent in the community. And if we look back in our culture and we look back in the beginning of our ancestry line when our Yupik names were first birthed, that first original person that was given the name Jannach did not at the time use Ikmi or Black Bull or use tobacco. So if we go back to through our lineages and our ancestors to find, you know, um, we we did not use tobacco, ICME, or Black Bull, and that could be a part of our messaging. Is um, our na our original namesake did not use it, therefore we should not use it. So um, ash alone is known to cause physiological effects, but when mixed with the tobacco, it dramatically increases the speed in which the nicotine reaches the bloodstream. So it's shown to be very, very potent, ICME. 
the mixture of the, the ash and the tobacco leaf. Um, when my sister came down to visit me in Michigan years ago, my niece was about um, six to eight years of age, and her grandma made her a ICPI care package, as I would like to call it. Um, I saw her throw a tantrum when, you know, I was trying to encourage my sister not to give her any, and I believe she probably was going through withdrawals, and so she gave it to her. And so ICMI and Black Bull has become a norm um, and is now viewed as a part of our culture, which is widely acceptable. So here is a picture of what you'll normally see, you know, a container, and you mix it together, and that's what it looks like, and you, you keep it in there, and, you know, people share it, and um, it's really commonly used. Um, so when we look at restoring wellness within our families and communities, we have to utilize our elders providing education on the harmful effects of ICMI, looking at harm reduction like I uh, was sharing, messaging which could um, include, you know, the pre-contemplation stage, the, con you know, contemplation stage, determination, action, maintenance, then termination, which is the stages of change. And so, um, you know, it's, you know, because it's commonly used, it's viewed as traditional, but if we start combating that as within those different stages, I feel like we will be able to have success. So breaking the cycle will only be done through utilizing our culture, tradition, language, and heritage of the people. So here is a picture of... Um, youth Eskimo dancing, also known as Yurak. And um, this is what you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, female elders, you, you always will see them wearing a qasbaq. Um, so this is known as their traditional wear. So like it states here, it takes a village to raise a child and it takes a village to break a cycle. So this is a mask dance. As you see in here, you, um, they're wearing qasbaqs, parkas, and this is a traditional wear, the Yupik people. Um, there's a picture in the middle, which I really had a hard time finding a picture of someone using dakhavak, which is like um, smudging, which is the same thing as smudging, but in Yupik it's dakhavak. And so this would be, um, so this is a common practice that has been uh, awakened in the past 10 to 15 years. And um, one of the times I did go home, I was walking around and I saw, to me, looked like sage. And it was, it was tundra sage. And so I picked some and took it home. And there it was my dad who talked to me about how they would dakhavak, and then so now, you know, it's used more in the steam houses to smudge, and that is what is going to help break the cycle. So, um, so going back to our traditions and using uh, shamans, traditional practitioners as a part of combating. Um, Ipni, black bull use, is through the culture and traditions of the people. So if you have any questions, I will be um, open to the questions as well, following Guyana. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Cooper with the California Rural Indian Health Board. 
and the California Tribal Epidemiology Center. And CRIB, has, we're also a partner of the National Native Network, and CRIB has been involved with um, tobacco cessation work since about 1991 through the American Indian Tobacco Education Program and American Indian Tobacco Education Network. Um, we've heard a lot today already about traditional tobacco and some on commercial tobacco. And we're going to be talking more about the messaging that we send out and advocacy and um, cessation practices that have been shown to work in the American Indian community. So just starting off, um, we do have an elder um, there in Way Hill, who's Chumash, who originally said, tobacco can both give life and take life. It's a very powerful, potent, and magical being whose properties can cause great harm when abused. The flip side is that tobacco can also provide great healing when not abused. And this is important because to understand the messaging that we send in tobacco advocacy, we have to understand the traditional application and use of tobacco versus the commercialization of tobacco. So we've already heard, um, you know, many tribes believe that tobacco came as a gift from the creator. It's used in prayers and blessings. It's used as an offering. It's medicine. Um, it's given as a gift oftentimes, and it's grown in a natural way. Um, just a word of caution, I do want to make sure um, we are talking about educating here about traditional tobacco, but when talking with different tribes, make sure that you know their norms and practices around traditional tobacco because some tribes will not talk about it because it is that sacred and only remains within the tribe. So those are, that's just something to keep in mind when working with tribes around traditional tobacco. Um, the commercialization started um, when Columbus came to the Americas. They did note in their diaries that the use of tobacco by many of the people they encountered. In the 1500s, um, Columbus took back tobacco seeds and that was used in Europe to grow snuff, and snuff was the most popular form of tobacco. Um, in the 1600s, over 20,000 pounds of tobacco was brought back from the colonies to Britain as a way of increasing tobacco. And then in the late 1650s, the tobacco had spread to Russia and Asia and other countries. And the commercial tobacco, um, has, grown, has been grown and manipulated and engineered to provide flavor and higher nicotine amounts to keep people addicted. It has many fertilizers added in the growing process. Um, the commercial growing and drying process cuts off oxygen, which creates nitrosamines, which are one of the main cancer-causing agents within commercial tobacco. And that's in addition to all of the um, other cancer-causing chemicals that we have been known that have been added to cigarettes and chew to make them more palatable and better smokes. So as you can see, the commercial um, tobacco process has nothing in common with the traditional tobacco um, growing process. And over the years, um, the industry, commercial industry, has used stereotypical American Indian imagery um, in the past and today to sell commercial tobacco products. Um, the commercial industry tries to reframe reframe commercial tobacco use as part of the culture. Um, even if you can see the bottom corner of the um, vignette cards that are added in the natural American spirit, the, com the company does try to come off as being kind of a traditional tobacco format, but it's owned by R.J. Reynolds, who's one of the largest tobacco companies. And they have vignette cards of elders, and we like to talk with kids about imagine seeing one of your elders in a box of cigarettes. It's not like baseball cards. This is something that isn't popular, and they have stopped that, but that was used to try and attract people um, to get them to start using their products. So when we're talking more about messaging, um, if you're just trying to say to give up tobacco, that's not going to work because tobacco has so many meanings, whether it's traditional or commercial, you have to differentiate between the two. Um, there's been some states that have tried reaching out to decrease the amount of smoking, 
and the tribal communities, and they just you know quit smoking, give up tobacco, and it doesn't work because when you say to give up tobacco, it could be meaning traditional tobacco, and that is something that is held very sacred to people versus you just say we'll give up smoking or commercial tobacco because there's not that connection with the commercial tobacco. There's nothing sacred about commercial tobacco versus the traditional tobacco. And it's also important to have champions within the community to deliver the message. Um, people hear the message much better if it comes from within their own community um, of needing to quit using commercial tobacco products. They are more open to that. So just things to keep in mind as we're working with cessation and prevention tools. Um, the tools need to reflect the cultures and traditions. Keep in mind uh, there are 508 individual nations within the U.S. Um, from all over the U.S. There's different ideas, there's different values, there's different cultures. Don't just assume that your work is going to be a one-size-fits-all. Um, just as if you're working with the general population, something that might work in California or Oregon or Washington may not work in the New England area just because of the different cultures and norms. So please keep that in mind to know the culture and traditions that of the people that you are working with. And then going back to kind of hammer this in some more, um, needing to differentiate between commercial and traditional tobacco and use. So I do want to talk about some cessation and prevention tools. The most common one is the second wind cessation. Um, this was really adapted from American Cancer Society's Fresh Start curriculum. It was designed specifically to help American Indian Alaska Natives to stop smoking and remain smoke free. And it provides basic information about smoking, practical counseling, problem solving skills, and social support. Um, this curriculum has been evaluated and has been shown to work. And, and the second one cessation program, there are six different sessions. Um, they are done as a talking circle. There's a focus on American Indian activities and games as stress relievers. So bringing back in some of those traditions. Um, they role play different trigger situations. Or just when you feel like you need a cigarette or you need a, a dip of chew, um, what are some things that might trigger that and going on from that of how you can avoid that. And then it also include, discusses the role of traditional tobacco. Uh, making sure that people know the importance of traditional tobacco versus the abuse of the commercial tobacco and how the abuse of the commercial tobacco is hurting them. Another program is Seeds of Honor. Um, this was developed by CRIB several years ago. It's a youth cessation program geared towards youth aged 10 to 18. Um, there has been some evaluation on it. And it's, the relevance is it includes talking circles and prayers, um, creating a sacred space and sacred objects, using traditional stories, um, elders as guest speakers and significance, and the use of traditional tobacco through the classes and a commitment circle. Um, and the importance of that is we really want to stress to youth at a young age because youth have an easier time quitting because they're not as addicted to the nicotine um, as someone that's had a 30 or 40 year addiction with nicotine. It is easier for youth to quit, but we want to replace that with them by talking about traditions and things that are important to be able to spread that to others to know, well, I don't want to use, I don't want to smoke, that's not traditional. I want to use this in a sacred way and the way it was meant to be used. And so it does have two facilitators. Um, one facilitator is usually trained in cessation, and the other facilitator is a non-smoking tribal member that teaches about traditional tobacco. Um, it's usually a respected elder. Um, sometimes it can be the same person, and if it is, that's great. But we always want to make sure that in the community that we're doing this with, that we do have a 
tribal member from that community that can talk about traditional tobacco and how it's used within their own community. Um, we also have developed, and these are, there are copies available if people are wondering, um, in a good way, it is a DVD. It teaches youth about the importance of traditional tobacco and how to use it and cultivate it. Um, it comes with a questionnaire that can be done in the group. And when presenting it to the community, like I said, um, knowing your community, for me, I always first give it to the elders advisory group if there is one, or a group of elders to review it first to see if it's appropriate for their community and let them work with the youth on it so they can address the things that are specific to their own community. Um, it also helps to do this as a community presentation with elders and youth so at the end the elders if there are questions about how their tribe specifically uses traditional tobacco, that the elders can answer that for the youth. Um, as part of keeping the tradition alive, um, I did work with one tribe that made their own DVD um, where the elders took the youth into the hills to show them how to gather the sacred tobacco and herbs, um, how they mixed it for prayers and how it was used. And then they made this DVD part of their um, education program so that the traditions maintained and used for preventing uptake of commercial tobacco. Other areas that we focus on are tobacco gardens. Um, a lot of times we will, we heard earlier, a lot of times you will see commercial tobacco being used for traditional purposes. You might see like drum and bugle or some other type of roll your own cigarette tobacco being used on the fire or in pipes, or in some cases you might see the MC of a powwow or big time being given a carton of cigarettes as a gift of to tobacco. Um, and then using commercial tobacco for sacred purposes, it sends a mixed message to youth. Um, and oftentimes the reason that commercial tobacco is used is because of a lack of access to traditional tobacco. Um, Traditional tobacco can be grown in a community garden or another garden so that there's always access to traditional tobacco to be used in traditional ways. And if you don't have any prior to doing a ceremony or an event, ask people if there is some available um, so that way you're not using the commercial tobacco for those traditional purposes. One of the things we mentioned, um, I know earlier where this wasn't working was the sound, um, but you will receive links to these on the email that you'll get. Um, you want public service announcements that are tailored to the individual community. And as you look at these links that are here, um, they were done by United Indian Health Services and the Northern California Indian Development Corporation, but focused on youth giving messages about commercial tobacco and even traditional tobacco and the importance of remaining commercial tobacco free. It was very tailored to their community and their own languages and that's the importance of being able to work with them to give that message specifically because people are more likely to hear that message when it relates specifically to them. I would encourage you to watch these videos. You can find a few more through YouTube. And then other areas that we do want to look at is increasing cessation at the tribal level, so developing strong tribal tobacco policies. Um, through I know this one's controversial, but um, through economic development, it's starting to look at ways to move away from smoke shops. Um, it's hard to provide cessation services if cigarettes are readily available and cheap. But working with ways to find, even if you do want to use, continue to use house smoke shops, as you're building that money, finding other ways to invest it in economic development so you can begin to phase out your smoke shops. Um, creating a tribal tips video, it's very similar to the CDC one, and once again, if you're seeing the commercials on TV, once again, this is localized to the community. You can work um, with youth and others to interview elders, 
to talk about what commercial tobacco abuse has done to them, messages that they would have to young people or other folks in the community giving, thinking of starting to smoke or use chew. Um, one place that we did make a tips video with, just through the process of it, they had 18 youth and adults sign up for their first cessation class. So it is very impactful to the community because these are people they know and people that have an effect on their community. And they can see through the health impact of it and also where as people are dying earlier because of tobacco, commercial tobacco use, the loss that comes to the community and the loss of tradition and wisdom that comes. And sometimes if you can find someone, you can get an example of elders or council members that are quitting commercial tobacco use that does set a great um, view for the community members, a great example for them. So I also will be available for questions or if there's materials that you saw that you would like, um, you can contact me by email or by phone. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Downwin, Mr. Abramson, Mrs. Bailey, and Mr. Cooper. If any of the attendees have questions, please type them into the chat box. We will read the questions and uh, look to have answers from the presenters this afternoon. We did have one question earlier, and that was, will these slides be available for viewing later? And the quick response is yes, they'll be emailed out to everyone as PDF documents. So again, if there's any questions, we just ask you please type them into the chat box on your screen and we can uh, pose that to any uh, particular presenter for a response. There was one question that came in, was how far do the men travel for healing and presentations? So I think I'll gear that to uh, it was a question again for how far do the men travel for healing and presentations? Tony or Harlan, could you respond? Okay, can you hear us? Yes. Sorry, we're unfamiliar with the software, but, um, you know, people come from all over, really. Um, it's help-seeking. So, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, people are coming as a, a last-ditch effort um, if they're in their stage four cancer. Um, but other people, this is the program, you know, this is the healing they've always used. And, uh, you know, the more people learn about their culture and how, how to do, how to handle uh our medicines and offering tobacco, um, you know, more people come and they understand that offering tobacco is, is our way and that, uh, you know, to seek help. They, they come from all over, literally all over the nation, um, but in, we provide services to the seven county service areas, so we travel a great deal as well, but they try to meet, meet us at a, each of our clinic sites. But uh, perhaps Harlan can talk about his life experience because uh, he's, he's literally had people come from quite a few places. Uh, last weekend I was in Calgary, Alberta doing healing ceremony for a sick child there. Um, and that was just over the weekend. Um, I've traveled to New York, to uh, California, to Colorado, to oh, all over the northern area, Montana, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, Michigan, uh, and that's 
where I've been doing uh, Native ceremonies for people. But, and Tony mentioned people do travel to our community and are coming to our, uh, uh, for healing services in our community. And we've had people from Israel, uh, Africa, and um, Russia, actually. Uh, we had a Russian couple that didn't speak English come into our community and ask for help. Uh, I guess uh, in Russia they have a similar type of uh, community healers like we have here, our uh, healing people. Uh, anyways, uh, we, we, we travel quite a bit and people travel quite a bit to come to us. So it's, it, it just, uh, I guess there's no limits on it if you want healing. Part of it is to seek it out and come to the people that you need healing from. And like I said, the little baby that I went to see was uh, in, a, in the hospital in very critical condition and um, needed uh, help from a healer. And the family knew of me and uh, I went there and helped that family. So it depends. It depends on the situation. Like in our community, we see our elders. Um, we believe that uh, we provide that service for our elders and with the respect that we have for them. Uh, but if you're willing and able, part of your healing is to go to seek out a healer on your own and make your way there. Uh, that's the appropriate way and cultural way that we do do that. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Tony Harlan. Uh, we have some questions that have come in. I'm going to ask just through the time uh, for our presenters just to respond uh, uh, as, as quick as you can, but as also as detailed uh, as far as response. Uh, Chris, does Mr. Cooper have advice on approaching a discussion about tribal smoke shops? Um, I don't have advice on that yet. Um, normally, I know when you do t begin to talk about that, um, the usual response is kind of um, you're taking, um, you know, the coats off of our kids' back or similar responses. Um, it's something that's become very ingrained into the culture. Um, a lot of people, that's their first job. Um, that's a gathering place. Um, what I can say is since tobacco has become, commercial tobacco has become under the guise or under the jurisdiction of the FDA, um, they have recently increased their um, enforcement staff. And they are beginning to do more of looking at tribal smoke shops because um, they are in the federal jurisdiction, not necessarily state jurisdiction. Um, so you may approach it from that of just beginning to talk with them even about retail surveillance um, with youth to check out their advertising to make sure it's compliant or other areas. Um, that's an area that is going to be an uphill battle and depending on where you're at and what other resources there are for economic development. I do know some have brought up some areas of the country, though the tribes have specifically began to tax their t smoke shops for tobacco products, and it goes back into the public health and environmental fixes for the tribes. So there's can't give a specific answer, but there are ways to begin to at least begin conversations around some of the issues with smoke shops. Thank you, Chris. A question for Tanya came in. Could Tanya talk about how dance is connected with cessation? And I'll try and answer it the best of to my abilities. Um, in speaking to um, Eskimo dancing or any kind of dance, Native American dance, it's going back to our culture and traditions. Um, I know uh, Eskimo dancing is a part of celebration, it's a part of our ceremony, and it's a very huge part of our prayer, and there's some songs and some dances that are actually healing, and so when we're talking about how dance is correlated to um, smoking sensation, that's, that's how it would be, you know, correlated to is um, the healing and prayers of a wellness for you, um, us as an individual family and community. So I hope that answers that question. Miigwech. Guyana. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, for, for all the uh, presenters, 
anyone can answer this, do you feel it's important to add the use of traditional tobacco on the youth risk behavior surveys to help students differentiate between traditional and commercial tobacco? Again, a question to any presenter. I can reread it one more time. Do you feel it's important to add the use of traditional tobacco on the youth risk behavior surveys to help students differentiate between traditional and commercial? Uh, I think uh, any kind of awareness for uh, youth is, uh, is, is, is well and good, uh, like the surveys, I would include it. And um, also, like uh, I talked about, is that if uh, you are to use traditional tobacco in your home, start teaching your children uh, the, about the sacredness and how it is used appropriately in our ceremonies, uh, that we do not use it in a risky way. Uh, when we use it traditionally, and I do agree that uh, you know, as some sort of uh, awareness to, to traditional tobacco uh, and to abuse, uh, we need to really differentiate those two: abuse and traditional uh, traditional use. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harlan. Any other presenter to respond on that? I just, I, I'd like to say agree with Harlan. We do have one last question, I think, on our time. I'll, I wish uh, we had more time to respond to that. We'll take a question, but I think I'll go to Harlan on this. Um, if you put tobacco on an open sore on a diabetic person, would that heal it? Hello. Um, our tobacco is really powerful. Uh, if you put it in there, it'll probably burn a bit. Um, and I don't know how much uh, medicinal help it would uh, do for that open sore. But if you offer that to a healer in an appropriate manner, we probably could get you a traditional medicine that can help heal the sore for you. So it would help in that way in offering to a traditional healer, but uh, tobacco has its medicinal purposes, but it's not for healing open sores. Good. Thank you, Carlin. <clears throat> and thank you for attending the National Native Network Technical Assistance Webinar. The post-webinar survey link will come to you by email today. Please complete this survey and indicate whether you'd like to receive any continuing education credits or a certificate. In our language, we say miigwech. Thank you for your attendance this afternoon in today's webinar.